So the way a mother rat takes care of its pups is by licking and grooming, nipple switching, and arch back nursing. So the rats that do a lot of licking and grooming and their last rats that rule very little. But most rats are in between. So that resembles a human behaviors as well, right? You have mothers that are highly mothering and mothers that couldn't care less. And most mothers are somewhere in between. So if you look at these rats, so all you do you observe them and put them in separate cages. So you put the high lickers in one cage not the mothers, but the offspring and the low lickers in another cage. And then you let them grow and they're adults now. Their mothers are long buried. And you look in the brain and you see that those who had high, licking mothers express a lot of glucocorticoid receptor. Gene and those so our lawmakers express no that reflects a number of factors and that results in a different stress response. But this is not the only difference. We found later on there are hundreds of genes that are differently expressed. So if you get in a mutation, you know polymorphism once in a million. Welch is a Celtic language spoken in Wales by about 740,000 people, and in the Welch colony in Patagonia, Argentina by several hundred people. There are also Welch speakers in England, Scotland, Canada, the USA, Australia, and New Zealand. At the beginning of the 20th century about half of the population of Wales spoke Welch as an everyday language. Towards the end of the century, the proportion of Welch speakers had fallen to about 20%. According to the 2001 census 582,368 people can speak Welch, 659,301 people can either speak, read or write Welch, and 797,717 people, 28% of the population, claimed to have some knowledge of the language. According to a survey carried out by S4C, the Welsh language TV channel, the number of Welsh speakers in Wales is around 750,000, and about 1.5 million people can understand Welsh. In addition, there are an estimated 133,000 Welsh speakers living in England, about 50,000 of them in the greater London area. Let's take a look at this video of these little kids. They were offered the option of having one marshmallow immediately now, or two marshmallows 15 minutes later and you've got some very cute videotape of this experiment. So let's take a look okay. What we found is a very simple and direct way of measuring a competence that seems to make an important life difference. A researcher tells these preschoolers that she's going to leave the room if they wait for her to come back without eating the marshmallows. They'll get two marshmallows or they can ring the bell and she'll come back right away, but then they only get 
one marshmallow. I would baby though you won't ring the bell okay? Looking at children over time. Doctor, Michelle has found that being able to wait longer at four has some pretty powerful implications. And what are those powerful implications is that that later in life, they're more disciplined and have more self-control is that pretty much it. Well, they are more likely to achieve their life goals. They have better relationships. They did better on their Sue is crazy all because they waited 15 minutes for don't wash me and I think it is crazy. I probably would have eaten all three but yummy too. In 1845 the French social reformer Victor, consider Ant wrote, Paris is an immense workshop of putrefaction, where misery, pestilence and sickness work in concert, where sunlight and air rarely penetrate. Paris is a terrible place, where plants shrivel and perish, and where, of seven small infants, four die during the course of the year. The street plan on the Tide de la Site and in the neighborhood called the Quartier d'Arsis, between the Louvre and the Hotel de Ville, City Hall, had changed little since the Middle Ages. The population density in these neighborhoods was extremely high, compared with the rest of Paris. In the neighborhood of the Champs, Iacis, there was one resident for every 186 square meters. In the neighborhoods of Arc is and saint avoy in the present third arrondissement, there was one inhabitant for every three square meters. In 1840, a doctor described one building in the Thai de la Site where a single room five meters squares on the fourth floor was occupied by 23 people, both adults and children. In these conditions, disease spread very quickly. Cholera epidemics ravaged the city in 1832 and 1848. In the epidemic of 1848, 5% of the inhabitants of these two neighborhoods died. I believe our borders should be open, but if that is not politically acceptable for now, Europe should at least open up a legal route for people from developing countries to come work here. Over time, hopefully, we can move to a position where borders are completely open. Persuading septics won't be easy. That's why I think the argument for free migration has to be made at several levels. A principled case, it increases freedom and reduces injustice. A humanitarian case, it helps people much poorer than ourselves, an economic case, it makes us richer, and a pragmatic case, it is inevitable, so it is in everyone's interests to make the best of it. Freedom of movement is not just a matter of human rights and international solidarity, it is in our self-interest. Opening our borders may seem unrealistic, but so too, once, did abolishing slavery or giving women the vote. Campaigning for people's right to move freely is a noble cause for our time.
there is no denying that the concept of family has certainly changed in American society over the last few decades. Statistics continue to show that fewer Americans are getting married, and those who do so are having fewer children, or none at all. More marriages are ending in divorce. More people are living alone, cohabiting with someone, or marrying more than once in a lifetime and creating step families. Traditional families once dominated every neighborhood. A traditional family consists of a husband and wife, plus their children, whether biological or adopted, if they have any today. American society displays greater diversity, and many American households can be considered non-traditional under this definition. Family structures that may be considered non-traditional or alternative include single parenthood, cohabitation, same-sex families, and polygamy. Let's take a brief look at each of these. Single parenthood was fairly common prior to the 20th century due to the more frequent deaths of spouses. Our friends at the Highlands Museum and Discovery Center in Ashland, Kentucky, asked a very good question. Why is it dark in space? That question is not as simple as it may sound. You might think that space appears dark at night because that is when our side of Earth faces away from the sun as our planet rotates on its axis every 24 hours. But what about all those other faraway suns that appear as stars in the night sky? Our own Milky Way galaxy contains over 200 billion stars, and the entire universe probably contains over 100 billion galaxies. You might suppose that that many stars would light up the night like daytime. Until the 20th century, astronomers didn't think it was even possible to count all the stars in the universe. They thought the universe went on forever. In other words, they thought the universe was infinite. Besides being very hard to imagine, the trouble with an infinite universe is that no matter where you look in the night sky, you should see a star. Stars should overlap each other in the sky like tree trunks in the middle of a very thick forest. But, if this were the case, the sky would be blazing with light. This problem greatly troubled astronomers and became known as Olber's paradox. A paradox is a statement that seems to disagree with itself. Climate change, some adverse effects of climate changes to agricultural productions. Some lands are unsuitable for growing crops. There will be millions of people facing hunger in Africa in the future. Climate change will result in less production and less food. It is difficult for developing countries to deal with climate change due to their financial status and other issues. There are many people living in hunger especially in Africa. The climate change has devastating effects on world economy. The tropical areas on Earth are dry and hot, and are originally not suitable for food production. 
The change of the climate leads to extreme weather conditions such as flood and hurricane, which exacerbates the food production. As a result, it leads to a continuous decline in food supply annually around 10-17%. And this trend is perceived to be continue in the future by 2070. The regions suffering the most will be some African countries. This is one picture that you probably you all know what it is when you see it. It's a familiar looking image. It's something that probably we all have some personal experience with, right? This is a chest x-ray that would be taken in your doctor's office, for example, or a radiologist's office. And it is a good example of biomedical engineering and that it takes a physical principle. That is how do x-rays interact with the tissues of your body and it uses that physics that physical principle to develop a picture of what's inside your body. So to look inside and see things that you couldn't see without this device. And you'll recognize some parts of the image. You can see the ribcage here. The bones you can see the heart is the large bright object down here. If you have good eyesight from the distance, you can see the vessels leading out of the heart and into the lungs. And the lungs are darker spaces within the ribcage. This is a kind of object that you're probably all familiar with when you had the term robot, but I'm gonna show you the very, very first robots. These were the very first robots. They were characters in a play in the 1920s called Rossum's Universal Robots and they, the play was written by Czech writer called Carol Capic. And basically, these robots, you know, people tend to think of robots as kind of cute cuddly toys or, you know, Hollywood depictions kind of devoid of politics. But the first robots were actually created and imagined in a time of absolute political turmoil. You just had the First World War, you know, it finished had a devastating impact across Europe and so people will kind, and people are kind of reflecting on what does it mean to be human, what makes us human, those kinds of question. And this kind of context is, what inspired Capic to kind of write this play? And interestingly, these robots being human, they are actually in the play assembled on a production line, a bit like the Ford manufacturing production line. So even though they are human, they are assembled and these robots are designed to labor, and that is their primary purpose in society.
Turner, not surprisingly, painted one of the earliest pictures of London's fog in the 1835 painting The Thames Above Waterloo Bridge. Turner is a true-born Londoner, is advertising his familiarity with London's air problem by putting smoke and atmospheric pollution at its center. And as you can see, in here, the bridge is the central elements, which is a theme that's later taken up by Monet, and it's partly obscured by the steam and smoke, which rises from both sides of the river. Here, we see a shot tower, I think you can just about to see, which was constructed in 1826. Do you know what shot towers are? They produce shot for guns, ammunition, and they were very smoky, one of the more smoking industries. But it's barely visible, as you can see, as are the various industries on the Lambooth side of the river. There's, on this side, there's a steamship about to dock or preparing to leave. It's black smoke thrusting up to join the kind of swirling arc of smoke there. William Rodner sees this painting as a potent essay on the energy and complexity of modern polluted organism. Smoke, I think, here represents for a flourishing economy, which brings employment and food on tables but also the dirt and pollution associated with the fumes all seems to be tainted by sulfurous yellow. Jeannie spent the first 13 years of her life locked away in a small bedroom in her parents' home. In 1970, her parents were charged with child abuse, and Jeannie began rehabilitation with a team of psychologists and linguists. And scientists were using her experiences to answer the following question. If a person is deprived of language throughout their childhood, can they ever learn enough to be able to communicate well? At first, the answer appeared to be yes. Jeannie quickly began to learn new words for the objects around her, and even say phrases with two or three words similar to how toddlers speak. However, from there, her ability to communicate verbally plateaued. This is because she could not learn grammar, which linguist Noam Chomsky believes separates human language from the communication of animals. It appeared that Jeannie had passed the critical period of learning human language, which is thought to end around puberty. 